Hi, this is Gareth Summers, director, actor and actor trainer to offer more insights into Stanislavski's and actor's work. Action, if and given circumstances. These three elements are the essential spine of the system. They are direct antidotes to the problems Stanislavski identifies in the first two chapters. They have an instant and radical effect on the actor, but beware, it takes work and practice. You have to walk the road if you want to arrive at the destination. Action, the magic if and given circumstances. Let's start with action. It's hard to underestimate how important action is. Stanislavski's work is like a web of co-relating and co-affecting processes. At the center of this web lies action, connected by various strands to every other element in the system. Let's look at the chapter. First, Tortsov gives us a reminder on proper conduct and ethics. Maya gets up to give a presentation and she's embarrassed the students laugh. And he reminds them when and when not to laugh. You're only in competition with who you were yesterday. So be supportive, be sensitive, and your work and others around you will flourish. When Maria gets up to stand on stage, she pauses expectantly, wondering what to do next. The moment is described as riveting. She's scared of the audience and she tries to hide her face. It's a genuine act, but then she blows it. Her focus becomes that of an actor trying to please. There's a phrase in, in Japanese no theatre which tells actors not to be a beggar, but to be a warrior. In other words, don't ask for approval from the audience. She is self-conscious and uncomfortable and when Costia gets up he feels split between trying to please the audience and trying to ignore them. He becomes awkward, his focus is on the audience. Our problem in naturalistic acting is that if you do it well it becomes invisible. If somebody says, oh you acted really well, you probably didn't, they saw your acting. But if they said, wow that person, that guy, that woman, the things they went through that means they were on a journey with you and the character you played. You were invisible, your acting was invisible, and all that became visible were the dilemmas and the actions of the character. The invisibility of acting leads people who don't understand the craft to think it's just being natural. How big is that? And how many years does it take to master? Try this as you're watching. Be yourself or rather reproduce exactly what you did uh, a minute ago. Now, if I were watching you, that would add some self-consciousness to the sudden awareness of self. At the very least, you might try to look prettier or more handsome or more intelligent or more thoughtful. We're here to play life with its ugliness and its beauty, but we're not here to beautify ourselves. It has nothing to do, as Stanislavski would say, with art. Unless you're experienced, uh, as an actor, it's possible your movements lack the ring of truth. Because the action you were engaged with the first time round had a specific purpose. You spoke to explain. Or you sat too relaxed. You're not showing that you're relaxing. You're literally trying to soften your muscles. You're trying to sink into the chair. You're trying to give yourself some rest. Action is something done for a specific purpose. It is directed at the self, the world, or other people or things. When people go straight to objectives, motives or intentions, as they sometimes do in workshops, this can result in a lack of substructure. That is, the conscious mind is engaged, but not the unconscious or the subterranean and uh, somatic processes. Tortsov sits to have a break. That is his action, that's his intention, and he rests, and he really rests. And framed by the stage, this becomes fascinating. Tortsov uh, calls Maya up again and asks her to wait while he looks in a, in a notebook. And her simple attention as she's engaged in the basic action of waiting with her quiet attention on him becomes fascinating. Kostya notes that many of her strong points as an actor are revealed in contrast to the other times when she tried to gain attention. Afterwards she says, was I acting? I was just sitting, watching and waiting. Acting is purposeful action, says Stanislavski. You can be in action when physically still. Acting is action, mental and physical. Let's add spiritual, let's add emotional, let's add vocal to that definition. Often, as Stanislavski uh, uh, observes, stillness can be the result of strong inner action. So try this, sit 
and really want to run away. Really want to run away, but something holds you back. Be specific about your choice, but sit there with the inner action. Perhaps somebody or something terrible has happened and you freeze. You just freeze. While all the systems in your body are kind of registering. You're very busy internally, you're very still externally. That's inner action. It's important to demonstrate now how the notion of action braids with the magic if and given circumstances. If. 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 Tortsov gives Maya a scene to improvise. She can't pay her school fees, but her friend has a valuable brooch that she can sell to pay for them. She's lost the brooch. She can't find it. She can no longer attend the school unless she finds the brooch. Tortsov hides the brooch and says, look for the brooch. Now she gets up and she makes a big show of looking for the brooch. She acts emotionally. But when Tortsov asks where the brooch is, she doesn't know. He says, remember, you'll have to leave the school if you can't find it. The second time, she becomes more serious. She becomes more watchable and realistic. When asked how she felt, she says, I don't know how I felt. I was busy looking. She clearly enjoyed the first performance more, but the first time she was trying to suffer. And so she was not engaging the audience. But the second time, she was genuinely trying to find the brooch to stay in school. We could say she was trying not to suffer. She was trying to alleviate the anxiety of pain of not having the brooch. She was trying to stay in school. She was trying not to let down her friend who gave her an expensive item. But above all, she was focused on the brooch. She had what Stanislavski will later call objectives, tasks, inner action, outer action, and an object of attention. We'll come to these categories later in the book. But now Tortsov says, the way you looked the second time was perfectly right. And this verdict stuns Maya, who had such a good time with her melodramatic emotional performance. Tortsov said, we don't need mindless rushing about. You shouldn't perform actions in general. For action's sake, you should perform them in a way that is apt, productive, well-founded. He asks them all to demonstrate uh, some actions. Uh, the results are absolutely appalling. And they all try to produce feelings from nothing. And Tortsov says, you can't squeeze feelings out of yourself. You can't be jealous, loving or suffering. You can't force feelings. That only leads to the most repulsive kind of ham acting. When choosing actions, leave your feelings alone. They will appear of their own accord as a result of something that has gone before. Any mood that you have now, just drop in and feel that mood. And you'll notice there may be some cause. Something's happened, some background, some feeling. We're always in flow. We're always affected by what has just happened. So in this sense, while we're always acting, we are always reacting. Tortsov gives the students uh, a full stage set of a room in which to find the actions. But the students run dry. They have no context for their action. And when Tortsov asks Vanya to shut the door, he does so without thought. It doesn't close properly, and Tortsov uh, reminds him to do it with the intent of actually shutting it. Obvious? Well, no. Many times people act rather than do. And really, acting is about fulfilling the actual task. Close the door to get rid of the draft. Open the door to enter the room. We can go a little deeper. Here's an exercise for you. Every time you open a door in the next week, open it with a different purpose. Open it to impress. Open it to seduce. Open it to own the room, to hide, okay? If you're doing this on stage, the movement of the door or on, on the film, the way the door opens is gonna tell us something about your character if you're specifically working with action. So try that. If you're drinking, Drink for a reason, even if it's just quenching your thirst. <coughs> but it's specific, you're not just waving a cup around, you know. Okay. This is action, actual attention paid to a specific task. He notes that real properties are not the point of the drama, but the relationships and motives. He says when you play Hamlet, once you've been through all the complexities of mind, you will reach the moment when you have to kill the king. Will you really be unable to uh, finish the play if you haven't got a sharp sword? No. You can kill the king without a sword. You have to place yourself within the drama. For this reason, imagination is the basis of the next chapter. Properly founded, 
uh, and considered actions take longer to perform than unconsidered mechanical ones. If you're doing something for a purpose, you have an investment in it being done properly or achieving the purpose. If you're just doing the activity, you'll just do it very quickly. You won't really notice why. You cannot underestimate the value of this. Nothing should be purposeless. Nothing should be done in general. The idea of evil, for example, is general. It's a generalized idea. If I ask you to pretend to be evil, you'll just do some sort of awful kind of cartoon. But the purpose of manipulating people with no concern for their fate to further one's own end or to treat people as objects, that may be a manifestation of evil. So everyone who's playing Richard III has to find a different set of justifiable actions. They can't just play general evil. It's unwatchable. Big states like evil are constituted by a series of small actions. We don't generalize and we don't talk about the big states we just look at the small actions. Tortsov says, we justify action through external goals or inner motivating causes, circumstances under which and for the sake of which an action is performed. So anything that you do in your life, you do for the sake of some bigger uh, picture. You do it for the sake of something, to be a good mother, to be a good father, because you want to help, because you want attention from somebody. There are inner motivating forces and there are conditions that are external. You might do something because you'll get fired if you don't. On every level there are things that are presented us by our environment and by our own uh, productivity and our own habits and our own desires that are going to feed into action within a framework of specific circumstances. Tortsov suggests to the students that an escaped psychopath who used to own the house that they are in is on the loose and trying to get into the house. He gives the students these circumstances to play and he says, what if he were outside and what would you do? Let me ask you that question. What if there was somebody outside raging and they were trying to get into your house? what would you do? You see what happens? Suddenly the actions of the students become real. They want to barricade the door, measure their escape, they, they become watchful, they phone for help. Inner and outer actions are stimulated and suddenly everything has a purpose. They're behaving in line with the circumstances given them and with a purpose. After a, a second improvisation with different circumstances, Tortsov congratulates them on playing genuinely in the moment. They take on the circumstances and the events and the situation of the story and played them realistically with purpose-led actions. But what led you to that point, says Tortsov? One tiny word, if. And Stanislavski learnt uh, the magic if from his niece who played a game with him where she constantly asked, what would you do if, if you were cold, if you were hot, if you were tired, if you were an elephant? This game from his niece revolutionized Stanislavski's whole process. Note the difference between this word and the amateur approach we encountered in the last chapter. If I ask you to pretend to be cold, you'll probably rub your hands together, chatter your teeth. Now, if I say, what if it were cold? You would register the cold. Uh, and you would react. Now, if I say, what would you do if it were cold? You might get a sweater, you might turn up the heat, you might try and leave the room. This is an action with a purpose. If you were locked in the room, you, you would behave in a different way. These are the conditions of the story that are motivated into action by the magic if. The magic if is a, an activating force on the imagination which helps you to find purposeful action within the circumstances presented. What would you do if your lover betrayed you? Not how would you express your grief or how would you feel or how would you act that scene? What would you actually do really? The question for actors should never be how do I play that? It should be what would I do if it were true? Now you're thinking but how does that help me uh, play something I have no experience of? What if you lived in Victorian Britain? Well, there are many ifs there about language, clothes, m manners, ways of walking, which you would have to research to answer. But you can answer each one until you gradually move from your experience to the experience and the world of the character. Simply by saying, what if, what if, what if. The magic if is one of the most remarkable doors to creativity and it naturally braids 
with the notion of given circumstances, which is the next section of this chapter. It should be clear already that one needs to go through the text in huge and laborious detail to identify the facts and circumstances that dictate what kinds of action an actor should choose. Tortsoff notes there are many layered or many storied ifs which add up to the moment, and in complex plays or films there are a huge number of possible ifs. Often the key orienta orientating uh, questions needed in any given moment are summarised in the following seven. Though they're only a beginning, and I recommend you look online for a list of 101 questions for actors to help you in analysing any text that you are playing. The first question you need to answer as an actor within the circumstances of the play is, who am I? Start with the basics, fill in the gaps with your imagination. Pick apart the script to find out what type of person your character is. Where am I? The script will usually tell you where you are, but the important thing for an actor is to consider how the character feels about their place. There's a difference between public and private, and people move differently in different environments and different temperatures. What time is it? Year, season, month, day, time of day should all be described. And think about how the specific time of the play changes uh, the character. If it's set in Victorian England, a voice and proper etiquette will be different than San Francisco in the 1960s. What do I want? Character's primary motivation for everything they do in a scene. Also called the character's objective, which we'll get to later. What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? What do I do to get it? Why do I want it? There's a driving force, motivating forces, internal and external, that force your objective forward. What drives, what motivates your character? And how will I get what I want? How do you use your dialogue, your movements and your gestures to try and influence the other characters, to give you what you want? What must I overcome to get what I want? There's usually something stopping you from achieving your objective. Usually there's something or someone in the outside world impeding a character's advancement. Some of those seven steps to developing a character deal with elements that we haven't investigated yet, like objectives, but you can search through the book and find out. But the magic if allows us to ease into the work without forcing it. It arouses the, uh, it arouses the actor's dynamism. It starts consciously, but it does it through nature itself. It spurs an urgent call to action. And there's not a time when you should not engage in the magic if. We ask if, initially, but in the performance we live if. The given circumstances, as Tortsov uh, explains, is the source material to stimulate if into action. If we are to avoid that generalised, vague, emotional acting, that's not one quite, not one attitude or another, this sort of thing, you know what I mean, then we must be playing an action. And an action is purposeful. It's purposeful because we ask ourselves, what if of the given circumstances. The given circumstances are the plot, the facts, the incidents, the period, the time and place of the action, the way of life, how we as actors and directors understand the play, the contributions we ourselves make, the mise-en-scene, the sets, the costumes, the props, the stage dressing, the sound effects, etc, etc. Everything which is a given for the actors as they rehearse. If launches the creative act, and the given circumstances develop it further. Together, this stimulates genuine human passions and reactions. First establish given circumstances, then the truth of action will emerge naturally. It should be clear that one of the great skills of an actor is in really engaging with the given circumstances and with one's own human sensitivity and understanding. An actor needs to be empathetic, in touch with herself, and rigorous in research. Stanislavski says... We filter and shape the material of the author through our own personalities. And at the end of the chapter, he returns again to action. Action conveys the essence of a part. We judge people portrayed. We understand them through their actions in relation to specific events. Stanislavski again admonishes anything generalised or empty. Be specific, he says again and again. And well, he might... We still see vague, broad, emotional brush strokes used in some acting. You will never see this in the work of a great actor, and if you do, they cease to become great. And he observes that actors are often moved by their in-general acting. 
their in general feeling of joy or anger or happiness. It's self-indulgent. In most scenes you play a character that is not comfortable. What makes you think that being comfortable should be of any interest to an audience or a viewer? You have to be at ease with the discomfort of the character's feelings. You can get stuck in thought, um, understanding intellectually but not physically feeling action. But really, action has to come from the body, not the head. To update some of Stanislavski's principles, are two very useful terms that Polish uh, theatre director Jerzy uh, Grotowski developed in his work that can help us understand Stanislavski's notion of action. They are activity and impulse. Activity is the thing you do. That is walking, talking, drinking, moving chairs, singing, smiling, eating, running. Impulse is the felt desire to do it. If you move your arm, there's a physical impulse to move your arm. If you're angry, there's a physical impulse to move. You may suppress it, but the impulse is a, or you may let the, the impulse just play without playing the action. If you miss one impulse, you hit the next. To appear spontaneous and dynamic, one needs to become more in tune with one's impulses, and some people cannot feel them as well as others. But with training, it's possible to become uh, very sensitive. Try in your daily life over the next week to notice when you have an impulse to do something, an impulse to get up, or an impulse to make a cup of tea, or an impulse to shout, or an impulse to be aggressive, or to be loving. You may not act on all those impulses, so notice when the impulse becomes uh, physicalized. An action is impulse-driven activity done for a purpose. Sitting may be the activity, and the impulse to get up and smash, uh, smash something may be your inner action. You can sit still and be engaged in all sorts of inner actions, desires, impulses, thoughts and needs. All one's needs and impulses can be manifested outwardly in physical behaviour. Human symptoms emerge naturally from working with action uh, within the given circumstances and the confines of a character. They don't need to be actively attempted. You just work on that. Now I'm going to suggest that when you're engaged in an action sometime this week, like sitting down, try and do it for a different purpose. Or you're sitting on a bus, have a different reason for being on the bus. Just see what happens. Now the next thing that I'd like to just uh, flag up is reaction. Actors need to listen. If you know the Meisner system, this distinguishes Meisner's approach. Repetition exercises are the most important part of, of Meisner's work and can be useful for aligning action, impulse and reaction. There are strengths and weaknesses to the Meisner system, which I may discuss another time, but reaction is just as important. Now, try this. When you're talking to somebody, really listen as you're speaking. So as I'm speaking to you, how different is it if I'm, I'm listening to you? I can listen with my body. There are some characters, <clears throat> as you'll know from observing people in your life, who always push, confront and contend, driving actions forward. And there are others who always yield and respond. Some are talkers, some are listeners. Both are essential. Both are essential skills for an actor to practice. As a scene with no contention becomes flat and low in energy, and one that is all contention becomes tense, extreme and unreal. For now, it is worth noting uh, that the problem of always contending and the problem of always pushing action is as problematic as always yielding and only reacting. As you're going along your daily business, notice which you fall into or ask people, am I somebody who's always passive? Am I usually kind of on the uh, front foot? Try and play different scenes in your life with a little bit more yielding or a little bit more contention, pushing a little bit to make something, moving slightly out of your comfort zone in those areas. And then gradually you'll start to kind of expand your range of how you can behave and how you operate with people. And here are a few uh, things you can do. Let's say you're walking, walk for a new purpose. You're sitting, you're checking your phone. Do it with a different sense of urgency, a different need. Do it to, to achieve something new. An exercise for interaction, sit to do something. Sit to be still. 
Be still to register the bad news. Be still to accuse somebody. Be still to hold your ground. In your daily life, just become more aware of the circumstances around you, how they affect you, your inner impulses, and uh, the way that you tend to play actions. And uh, if you're looking at the text, try the seven steps to analyze a little bit. Ask as many questions as you can. Ask, why do I say it? Not, how do I say it? And I'll see you again uh, with the next video. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this video, please share it. Bye-bye.